Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Brian, and thank you very much uh, for, for attending. I was a little bit unsure of the audience that I, I'd get to today, but I, when I saw the title that uh, Brian wanted me to address is Will Trade Enable or Frustrate Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals? The answer from an economist perspective is, well, it's going to enable. Trade is, allows us to source goods from the cheapest uh, location, and we want to price environmental damage from that as well. Uh, includes environmental goals. So that, that's where I'm, I'm coming at. I may have oversimplified uh, the issues talking to a lot of people involved in, in business, uh, but I'm going to break it down to the core uh, economics of, of what I believe the, the issue is, and hopefully at the very least it provides a, a framework for discussion. So if we look at uh, international trade, and my first bullet point summarises, you know, trade will assist the achievement of sustainable development goals, with the caveat that we, we've got to think about externalities and political distortions. And you know, why am I, I so in favour of um, saying that we'll trade as, as a facilitator of these uh, sustainable development goals? Uh, we can go back to, uh, to the theory of, of comparative advantage, and we can think of trade as uh, like a, a source of technological change. So instead of growing flowers uh, under an artificial environment in the Netherlands, uh, we can import them from, from Kenya uh, using uh, the natural elements and at a, at a cheaper cost. So trade allows us uh, to achieve any given consumption bundle uh, at least cost. And those costs can include an environmental damage. And that is we want to, to price the, the externalities involved or, or the activities that aren't currently priced in the market. Uh, so the caveats there, uh, if we do have uh, externalities and we have different regulations in different countries, uh, David touched on before about emissions leakage or uh, the consumption of carbon emissions in one country being very different from the production emissions, uh, we can get distortions created from partial policy coverage uh, due to externalities that we have to worry about. Uh, but I think the big one is political distortions, is that we all know that lobby groups, uh, particularly in certain countries, uh, are very strong. Uh, and they can manipulate policies, and in particular trade policies, because it's always easy to pass off, we must protect ourselves against these evil foreigners. It's a lot easier than uh, a domestic policy where you're trading off different groups within the economy. And within that, uh, it's well known the problem of collective <coughs> where we might have a, a trade policy that harms each individual consumer by $10, $20 a year, but if we aggregate across all consumers, that can be very large, and we get a, a small gain to a very small number of producers, uh, but that's measured in the hundreds of thousands of dollars because there's only a small number of uh, producers. That group is very motivated uh, to come together to lobby for that particular trade policy. You know, the consumers are very geographically dispersed and it's, and it's a small loss for each of them. It's hard to get them together. So we can get a lot of policies go through where they, they create a, a net loss. And they don't allow trade uh, to flow as free as it would, so we're not um, not sourcing our production from the, the cheapest alternative, where the cheapest we can uh, look at environmental damage to from those trade of goods and services. So that's the, the base economics. Lots of this is taught at, at high school, so it's uh, a, a fairly standard framework, uh, and that's we would be in an ideal world. We recognise the power of comparative advantage. Trade is, a, is like a form of technical change. We would be aware of externalities uh, that would price into the market. We'd try and have uniform global coverage, and we wouldn't let political lobby groups get in the way of what we know is the most efficient, efficient outcome. Uh, we know we don't live in that world, uh, so my next slide highlights some issues where trade can be hijacked or some of the, the detailed nature um, of trade. So if you want to talk about Dr. Spock's ears, it's a nice um, example of how something small uh, can be turned into a big legal issue. So this is, relates to uh, the, the EU tariff on, on dolls, where it differs for non-human dolls and human dolls. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the Star Trekers out there will know that Dr. Spock's, I think, mother was human, but his father was Vulcan. So there was a big legal dispute on where does Dr. Spock fall into in this category. <laughs> The Chinese producers wanted Dr. Spock to be non, uh, to be a human doll and therefore not subject to the quota. Uh, 
groups, there was lobby groups in Europe that wanted uh, Dr. Spock to fall into the non-human category. So the official judgment was was made by measuring the size of his ears relative to his body. And they thought, well, no human has got ears that size, so therefore it's a non-human dog. So that's what happened uh, to Dr. Spock. Um, very minor issue. We have a, a you know large amount of, of legal. Sorry to interrupt. Does that mean that if, a, if there's a human that has uh, very large ears, he's not human? <laughs> Depends. So if they're larger than Dr. Spock's, uh, he could be classified as non-human. Officially By the EU. Yeah. 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 I'm beginning to resemble this comment. <laughs> <laughs> Myself and President Obama. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might have to be careful in his next visit. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also complicating the, the, the Dr. Spock case was that although there was support for from European doll makers for uh, Dr. Spock to be classified as non, not non-human, there were producers in the EU that wanted him classified as human because they made the accessories uh, that went with the Dr. Spock doll. So there was lobby groups on both sides, and I skip ahead, I won't do this, he's in order to the US-China uh, solar panel uh, tariffs. Uh, as we know, the uh, US is imposing tariffs on uh, the evil Chinese for selling solar panels that are too cheap, um, and that is to protect the domestic industry, but because of the global supply chain, a lot of the inputs used for the solar panels produced in China actually come from the US. Uh, so it's a, it's a complicated uh, framework. Uh, another uh, nice case to show how trade policy can be uh, distorted uh, is the 2002 US steel tariffs, which many of you will be aware, with, aware of. For political reason, the Bush administrations uh, to, gain, to support in, in certain states and the Rust Belt uh, imposed a lot of tariffs on steel uh, it was taken to the WTO, um, found not to be uh, WTO legal, so that the US was asked to remove the tariff. And this was a, a big crunch time in international trade, uh, with the WTO was having to stand up to the US. The US didn't want to remove <coughs> the tariffs and said, no, we're not going to. And this, the standoff was actually eliminated by some very crafty work by the Europeans. This is right, we're going to prepare a tariff schedule on a lot of products that are produced in the Rust Belt that are, that are exported to Europe. So therefore negating the political support. And that was when the US uh, decided to remove uh, the tariffs. So there's a lot of issues surrounding international trade that get us away from the, the, core, the core principle of what international trade can do for us, and that it's a, it's a form of technical change. Uh, the shrimp and turtle case uh, that relates to uh, the US wanting to ban imports of shrimp that are caught that didn't have uh, turtle safe nets, so there's a lot of turtle uh, bycatch. So this was an interesting case in that the WTO upheld um, the US right uh, to impose environmental stand standards through trade policy and as a not allow allowing imports of shrimp that were caught in an unsafe turtle fashion uh, with the caveat that they had to be applied in a non-discriminating way. So there was some people argue that the US did lose the case because they were applying to some countries and not others, but the WTA did affirm their, their right to um, impose their environmental policy through trade, provided it was in a non-distortionary fashion, equal for all countries. Uh, next on my list there I have uh, food miles, which is mainly a UK phenomenon spreading to Europe, but also uh, to, to the US where the distance food travel is considered to cause more environmental damage and therefore be bad. So there's a move towards local food and they have a little symbol uh, of the local food, food is miles better. Uh, so this is a form of a, a non-tariff barrier where lobby groups are trying to influence the consumer's opinion. Uh, and we only need to look at a lifestyle analysis to see that the distance <coughs> food travels or